Right, uh, good afternoon. What we're going to talk about this afternoon here is, um, is the local press coverage of the first cholera outbreak in 1832. I'll, we'll, we will refresh our mind as to what cholera, what cholera actually involves, what type of disease it is. But before we start talking about that, I want to talk about this as a, as a form of research, really. One of the gratifying things about doing this was that which, by the way, is something I do in my spare time. You know, this isn't a, um, this isn't a work-related thing. I, I feel as though I can fashion a story for saying this, this is work-related because it is roughly in the area of health. And I will try and, I will try and draw links to, um, to how other diseases, modern diseases, are treated as we're going through this. I mean, I think there's a story to say here about heart disease, for instance. You wouldn't think the two things were connected. But as we go through, I'll illustrate what it is that I what it is that I mean by that. We haven't even started. Sorry. They said you weren't coming. I said she'll be along any second. Can I go and get me dinner? You go. Get, it's, but, <laughs> what? Over, over in Sages. <laughs> go on, just go and get it. Go on, I'm only giving the introduction. I don't normally like making an entrance, but you know. <laughs> so the beauty about the, the the beauty about doing this from my perspective is not not just that this this is a subject that I'm interested in anyway, but this had the sensation definitely of you know when you go out first uh, well, when the, when it's just been snowing and you put your foot in fresh snow and the idea that you're the first person there I definitely got the sensation with this that this is sort of looking at this is sort of brand new you know that um, that nobody had ever really done this before I mean I've looked around and th there's nothing on the subject you know so this so the, 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 the sensation that this is brand new you, you're looking at something and that nobody else has Looked at before, but confusion and conflict. Well, that's what I want to. Th th those are the uh, those are the themes which come out of the press coverage. Just complete and utter confusion. They didn't have a clue as to what was causing this disease, how it might be best treated, um, and so we'll we'll talk about some of the themes that that that, that, that came out of the theories the theories of how to best approach this disease. For, um, for anyone who wants a copy of the talk, I've got it, I've got it in note form. This is, um, and what I've done is, I've copied into the note section a, um, the, the draft of an article which has been accepted for publication already in something called the Medical Historian, which is a local, um, a local publication, the uh, Liverpool Medical Institute, 250 years old, their medical history group. So this is uh, this is where I'm up to. I think it's what? Yeah. So let's just um, let's just first of all establish the setting that this took, this all took place in. Liverpool in the um, Liverpool at the end of the 18th and the early part of the 19th century was a city that was growing exponentially. I mean, if you take a look at, um, at pictures of the city in 1760 and in 1830, what it looks like is it looks like a petri dish where some infecting organism has gone crazy reproducing because all the streets look like um, whatever the whatever the <laughs> The, um, the organisms are, there are little rods, yeah? And over that 50, 60 years, they just spread out from the docks. Liverpool was drawing in tens and tens of thousands of people from the countryside, yeah? In search of, you know, more opportunities. And the, the, the urban areas, not just in Liverpool, but elsewhere, but especially Liverpool, um, the, the urban areas were, in Karl Marx's phrase, saving the population from a life of rural idiocy. And the effect of these people being drawn in was that a, a medieval infrastructure with no real, um, no real sanitation, no real water supply, had lamped on it a modern industrial conurbation. So the whole thing was a public health disaster waiting to happen. Now, we're going to be talking about cholera in a minute. 
Um, but I want I want you to consider this is a waterborne disease. You all know that, right? In the in the period that we're going to be talking about in the 1830s, Liverpool got its water supply directly from wells. Yeah, there were a number of wells, really productive wells as well, productive uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. But there was no sewage system, and therefore what people did was they used um, they used common latrines, privies, middens, as they were called. Now, in the normal course of events, you know this would just produce a lot of diarrhoea, maybe the odd outbreak of typhoid. But the fact that everybody was drinking water that was to one extent or another um, contaminated by feces meant that if one person got a fecal disease, and that feces went from the well from the cesspit into the well then there was p the potential for explosive growth of um of uh, incidence of illness so you've got this background hum of contaminated water um and then liverpool's a port that's the other thing you know so uh, liverpool was open for influences from all over the place so what did I do? Right, first of all, uh, local, this is just going to be a, a report of what the local press said. Yeah, the, our university has, I, I, was, I was with a group of students one day, and I was showing them how to use the university library, yeah? And I clicked on databases in order to show them CINAHL, the Cumulated Index of Nursing and Allied Health Literature, yeah? And there, on the list of uh, databases that were available for all of us to look at, was the index of 19th century newspapers. And I thought, oh, there's something I want to look up there. So you can search it, first of all. You can search what paper you're looking for. You can set dates between this date and that date. You can even search, um, you can even search words. So I used the search term cholera. Let's see what comes up for 1832. And then I looked at the papers it sounds a lot, doesn't it? But it was only a weekly paper, the Liverpool Mercury. So there's only 52 copies to look at, you know? So I just went through from January uh, one year to December the next, and I looked up the word cholera in each newspaper. Now, that wasn't the only. Sometimes I had to go back. Sometimes there was articles which were really about cholera, which didn't actually use the word. But I was astonished that you could actually search in what is, in effect, a photograph of a, um, a, a, of a newspaper page, and you could search for individual words. I, I didn't know that that was possible, but th there it was, clear as a bell. Right, so search term cholera, let's start off with that, for the year 1832, the first, the first year of a cholera outbreak, not just in Liverpool, but, um, but in the UK. This is a, as I said, a waterborne disease, um, it's acute onset, you know, you can be well in the morning, very ill in the afternoon, gone by the next morning, and it's basically death by loss of, uh, loss of fluid and loss of electrolytes. You will, you will dehydrate. Your, your large bowel normally has the role of... <laughs> That's heavy Satan. The, the no, your large bowel normally has the role, you will, you will remember, of drawing water out of feces, what cholera does is it turns that around so that um, so that your your um, your poor old bum turns into an ex an, an exit route for something that looks like that, you know. So what you're looking at there is plasmas, electrolyte, water. You know, the the least thing that you're going to say about this is we've left the world of poo. This is another world we've entered now. And once this starts, and this is a diagnostic sign, this rice water stool is a diagnostic sign of, um, a diagnostic sign of cholera. And, and you know, people would be gone in no time. And it was an unpleasant way to die. It was painful with muscle cramps and, you know, vomiting and diarrhea and gone. And it respected no one, you know, I mean, people who were perfectly well and healthy would be, uh, would be ravaged by this condition. Um, this book, I read this book after, I, after I'd started doing this work, and this book echoes to a remarkable degree 
some of the stuff that you will read people actually say, and I'll come back to, I'll illustrate what I mean by that as we go along. But this book is a really interesting, it's not a, it doesn't mention Liverpool, I don't think, but just as a global interpretation of, of what, what the cholera epidemics meant. Okay, so Asiatic cholera, notice, Asiatic, Asiatic, we'll be coming back to the, we want to draw a distinction right now between Asiatic cholera <coughs> and English cholera. But, um, the Asiatic cholera was uh, first detected in this area of, uh, this area of, of, of India, yeah, and then over the next, over the next century, yeah, between 1830 and the 1920s, wave after wave went right across and over to America, you know. So, firstly, firstly, imagine, if you will, the capacity for racist assumptions to start emerging as to the origin of this. This came from from dark, filthy, backward Asia, yeah, infecting us. Um, but as he mentions in his book, as old Hamblin there mentions in his book, things weren't as straightforward as that. Not, not, um, not at all were things as straightforward as that, because who was in charge of India at the time? Who was travelling the world with their boats, yeah? going from place to place, carrying who knows what, yeah? And the British were in charge of this whole thing. So, in one sense, although the Indians got the blame for it, yeah, in a, in a, in a wider sense, the blame could be spread out a lot further than that. Now, the other thing I want, you, I want you to consider is, this is just before the Victorian period. Can you imagine how uncomfortable it must have been for people in this period to be talking about unrestrained toilet activities. You know, this is not a, this is not a free and easy society the way we might be now, you know, but they were forced into the discussion of all of this. So as this wave was rolling towards Britain, they could see it coming. You know, they knew it had it, it, it broken out in Russia, it caused all sorts of trouble in, in Russia, and, um, and they were just helpless. It went through Hamburg, killed thousands of people in Hamburg, and it must have just been like a, a, a tide. And not just that, but the first reports in the Liverpool press aren't about events which took place in Liverpool, but they are about events which took place in Ireland, where in Ireland it really took off very fast. Yeah, Dublin. I mean, and, and in, the, in the Liverpool Mercury, each week there are tragic, um, there are tragic reports emerging from Sligo, where 250 people are dead, 500 people are recovered. You know, and so week by week, you get this picture of this um, unrolling disaster over in, over in Ireland. So the, um, they, they, started to, they started to discuss among themselves, how are we going to best prepare for this? And a, a special fund was, was to be set up, and in the select vestry organism of um, local government set up by the church, in the local vestry, the, uh, there was a large debate about how to actually fund these preparations. There were people who said, no, 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 we don't need any extra money. We'll just use the poor law monies. And there were other people who said, no, no, we need a special subs subscription fund. This is going to cost us money to deal with all of this. Let me just catch up with myself. So, for God's sake, I don't normally, uh, I don't normally approve of reading off slides, but, but this, this is so dramatic, for God's sake, let us not wait like men deprived of all sense till death reaches our dwellings. 
all England has striven more or less to meet the destroyer who has stridden over half the world to attack us and shall we alone let our friends fall around us on the right and the left or die ourselves for want of the time we are now losing and the money which will then not buy life. You know, this is, this is a, a sort of, you know, it, even, even 100 and nearly 200 years later, the sort of passion behind this still speaks for itself, doesn't it? Um, so, um, English cholera, what was it? Well, they didn't have act they didn't even know what caused this disease, right? They had no idea what caused it. And the word cholera had actually, it's an ancient word, isn't it? You know, it comes from, um, it comes from the humoral theory of, uh, of disease. You know, you, it's too much bile one way or another, yeah? So the, the English cholera, a diarrheal disease, yeah, had been around forever, yeah? But this was something new, you know? English cholera, uncomfortable, but benign. And so doctors, doctors who attended these patients were called upon without the aid of microscopes, without the aid of any germ theory or nothing like that, and we're, and we're only ever having seen one or two cases, were called upon to, to judge whether this was good old fashioned British English cholera or nasty foreign <laughs> malignant Asiatic cholera, otherwise known as spasmodic cholera, yeah? And people thought, they had, people thought that these were two, two separate diseases. Of course, we're probably on part of the same, what we would now call spectrum. You know, it's probably just a dose effect, wasn't it? You know, you've got to get a proper, to get a, a proper case of uh, cholera underway, you've got to take 100,000 of the organisms responsible into your, into your digestive. So, so the, whole, the whole picture of when the, um, when the epidemic hit, hit the city, it is kind of confused by this because how would they know? So there you're on the right, you've got cholera coming into Ireland. On the left, you've got the reports which are coming in from um, reports which are coming in from the rest of Europe, in particular Paris. Yeah. Uh, anyone seen um, anyone seen the new film of Les Miserables? Set in 1832, the same year as this outbreak, and uh, the Liverpool Mercury point, uh, points out in its um, in its foreign affairs column that that riots had broken out uh, on the streets of Paris, uh, chiffonier, yeah, rag pickers. This sounds a lot more glamorous, doesn't it, in French, Chiff chiffonier than rag pickers. Um, but chiffonier, the, the, the chiffonier in Paris were rioting. Now, what was the source of this rioting? Why did they think that riot was a, um, a, an appropriate action? You can see here, look. Liverpool, Friday the 1st of June, 1832. Cholera. Disgraceful outrage. And the, the, not just in France, but also in Russia. The idea got round among the poor that Cholera was a disease which was deliberately set among the poor um, in order to undergo something, in, something like ethnic cleansing. They wanted to get rid of a load of poor people and they set this disease. There was, special, there was a special theory that ran through the streets of Liverpool, but the idea was that this was deliberately done. The, the doctors and the magistrates and the government had deliberately set this off. So there was murder going on in Paris. And uh, possibly, possibly to calm public fears, the, um, the Liverpool Mercury reports that in a cholera hospital over in Paris, the Prime Minister, a, um, Mr. Perrier, yeah, um, he visited the cholera hospital, yeah, and then about Three days later, no, the next issue of the, uh, of the Liverpool Mercury, it reports that um, Monsieur Casimir Perrier had been taken ill, and a month later, they report his funeral. So whether or not he caught something when he went to the, uh, the hospital to calm things down, who knows? 
But there was rioting in Belfast and Dublin, absolutely. Um, in fact, there was, there was unlimited unrest over in Ireland. You know, so there's the, there are the authorities. They've got this new disease that, that's sweeping the country, you know. It's an international problem. And on top of everything else, dealing with the dead bodies and the infection and all the rest of it, they've got public order problems breaking out. Amongst the great members of the lower classes, the idea is prevalent that the cholera is a mere invention of the medical men to fill their own pockets and that the hospitals are nothing more or less than receptacles for victims of experiments when living and subjects for the dissecting knife went dead. Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that this is, um, this is uh, an exaggerated fear. I mean, this was the fear that ran through the public in Liverpool. Yeah, that the doctors were trying to get their hands on dead bodies. But 1832 was the year that the Anatomy Act was, was, um, was enacted in Britain. And what the Anatomy Act did for the very first time was it permitted in, in people whose family members did not object the dissection of human corpses for education purposes. Yeah? Prior to this, uh, bodies had been worth a fortune on the black market um, there was a, in, in 1830 I think it was, a, um, a, a doctor in Seal Street in Liverpool was prosecuted successfully for running an illegal mortuary and it, it was 1827 up in, um, up in Edinburgh, Burke and Hare had been, um, had been successfully prosecuted for killing people who stayed at their boarding house and selling their bodies onto the anatomists. Um, and in the, in, the, in the Liverpool riots, does anybody know anyone, uh, someone, who, a public health physician called Jeff Gill? No? Okay. Jeff Gill wrote this, he's, Liverpool, he's a Liverpool fellow, and he wrote this article for The Lancet, got published in The Lancet, this, about the, uh, the cholera riots in, in, in Liverpool. And the, the story was that up to 1,000 people, mostly women, mostly boys, were pursuing doctors who were removing patients out of their home and taking them to cholera hospitals, specially built cholera hospitals for the crisis. They were pursuing them and they kept on shouting at, after them. All this is reported in the press. They kept on shouting after them, bring out the burkers! Burking her, yeah? And then they were stoning the, um, they were stoning the hospitals where they were taking these people to. Why? Because they suspected that Nana wasn't being taken out for her benefit, but she was being held on to there, so as soon as she's dead, they can dissect her. Now, I've given to you an indication of how cholera is spread. You drink the water that has touched one way or another, the water coming out of someone else's cesspit. That's how it... Now that raises the whole question, doesn't it, of is this a contagious disease? It's not contagious in the ordinary sense of the word. That is to say, if he's got cholera and I haven't, and we have this sort of contact, then, you know, I won't get sick, yeah? I won't get sick. On the other hand, he might go to the toilet here, I go and have a drink, we never meet, I get sick tonight. You can see how that works? Now, it's not entirely clear that that's contagious in the accepted sense of the word, you know? But this was a really big issue. And I'm presenting this now as a, as a, a, a cross-infection question. But this had many, many more implications than this. Hamblin, in his book, says that to say that, a, um, to say that a, the, the disease was contagious implies a set of actions following it. If something's contagious, then you quarantine the, the infected person. That's easy to do in Russia, which was an autocratic government, a militaristic government, if you like. That was easy to do. Now, in a Western democracy, that's, that, that's less easy to do. You know, there are, legal, um, there are legal protections for people like that, yeah? But the big issue here, and the issue that people came back to again and again in the paper, was the question of trade, yeah? If you describe this as a contagious disease, 
the city gets quarantined, no boats in, no boats out, and for a city that depended on trade, that was the worst disaster. So everyone in the city is committed kinda to saying, no, no, this is not an infectious disease. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. There is a circumstance connected with the cholera, which distinguishes it from most other diseases with which mankind is afflicted. We advert to its attacking other animals in common with man, and that vast numbers of fish and hares, in particular, have been found dead. Now, the thing I want you to, the thing I want you to take from that is the wonderful sense of confidence. You know what I mean? This is a doctor in full confidence in full consciousness of his position and he will have seen a bit by then because because the uh, the incidence of cholera up in Scotland was really high yeah um, but full of cholera and completely balmy on, on what sort of observation was that based okay here's something else this is a paper that's, this is an article that's published in the, in the Liverpool Mercury uh, the effect of imagination on the production or aggravation of disease, right? Now this, again, Hamblin mentions this book. I'll give you an illustration of what he says about it. But this theme crops up again and again in the paper. It's this. If you go worrying the population about this, then it's going to incline them to get the disease more. So we've got to calm everything down, yeah? Uh, they, they thought that the act, they, they thought it was literally the case that the, the only thing you had to fear was fear itself because they thought that fear would induce the disease. Now, Hamblin in his, Hamblin in his book, he says that this idea went so far that in um, Siam, modern day Thailand, where there was an outbreak, the, um, in order to lift the spirits of the population, the king organized one big sort of big party for every, for the population you know what i mean and everyone was invited to this party 2000 dead because they all got sick <laughs> um, but this idea you know what people what, what people were very frequently saying in the paper was look don't talk this disease up talk it down because if we keep everyone calm Desultor, someone signing himself Desultor in the paper, wrote an article where he said that he'd heard, he'd heard that the cause of this, the cause of this illness were what he described as animaliculi, yeah? And that over, over areas where there was cholera, there was an increase in tiny, sometimes smaller than your eye could pick up. Um, small creatures, and he, 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 he recounts an experiment that was done where someone took a kite over a cholera area, stuck some meat on it, stuck some bread on it, and stuck some fish on it, yeah? And he put the kite up in the air, and the, um, the meat and the fish came back down. Uh, it doesn't, there's no reference for this, by the way. <laughs> uh, the meat and the fish came down, as he says, in a putrid state, yeah? But the bread... The bread was full of these little tiny animaliculi that he thought was causing the disease. Uh, drunkenness, that was another one. Poverty, the, I remember I said before that um, I would draw out common threads with, um, with, with what happens today. You know, if there is a disease which no one fully understands, the first knee-jerk reaction of the healthcare professional is to find something in that person's life that they can blame. I mean, heart disease, for instance, you know, heart disease, half the time with heart disease, you're pointing the finger at the poor person who's got it. But I love this phrase, poverty, poverty. It affects poor people more. And you can imagine why it affected more people more. Poverty, however li liable they might be to the cholera, they escape the infection of chlorophobia, a mental disease which is perhaps nearly as painful, though not as fatal as the disease itself. Yeah, but perhaps not as painful as well, you know. 
don't bother reading this. Don't bother, because I want to read it out to you. And all I want to say to you is, listen, listen for the sort of Morecambe and Wise tone to all of this. The wind, the wind, it comes from the sea. With a wailing sound it passed. Tis soft and mild for a winter's wind, and yet there is death on the blast. From the south to the north hath the cholera come. He came like a despot king. He hath swept the earth with a conqueror's step, and the air with a spirit's wing. We shut him out with a girdle of ships, and they guarded quarantine. What ho, now which of your watches slept? The cholera's passed the line. Now in that, in that, I think you can see, again, you know, scepticism about any, any usefulness of a policy of quarantine for the city. Okay, the ship Brutus. In about June, this report comes in that a ship called the Brutus um, had got as far as Cork and was turning back to Liverpool. Right? Now, this is 1832. Now, that's, that's not the Brutus, but it's, a, it's an advert of, a, of, of a, another boat that was going to be taking people across to um, Canada. Yeah? Now, the, okay, so the ship goes out, comes back, and 90 people are dead on board. The ship gets quarantined. Eventually, they bring a plague ship from over in the Tyne to put the, the rest of the victims on, yeah? Um, and all the people on it are really ill, yeah? There were a lot of survivors. Now, the thing I want to I draw your attention to here is, look at the size of that boat. It's not going to be a big boat, yeah? And on that boat was 300 passengers. 300? Um, now, in the Liverpool Mercury, this really touched a nerve, this boat, because apparently, although I didn't read, I didn't go back in the issues, the, 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 the Liverpool Mercury had run a campaign to say, look, we are not treating emigrants well here. You know, this is a disgraceful way to be sending people to the new world. These people are packed in like sardines and they make a point, I don't know whether it's coming up on another slide, they make a point that the, um, the number of patients, the number of um, people on these boats as a function of the amount of tonnage of cargo was worse in some cases than the last days of slavery. They were packed that tight. Each passenger began to view his fellow with a look of fearful apprehension. Sympathy became absorbed in the fear of general danger. This is from a letter <clears throat> written by one who sympathises with his fellows who must leave their country. Um, and this fella wrote, wrote a load of letters off to the Mercury, um, detailing how things were going. Oh, there it is, look. An Englishman who sympathised with all who said, The doctor's melancholy movements were viewed with almost the listless gaze of inanimation. Um, the whole paper's written like this, by the way. I mean, this sort of Dickensian, um, high-flowing high prose. The Mercury editorial, we particularly recommend an examination of the water casks as the quality of that element may have had much to do with the production of pestilence which has proved so fatal. There's, uh, there's forward looking, isn't it? You know, this, um, this predates Jon Snow by some 20 odd years, 25 years. Um, <clears throat> Was it cholera? Was it typhus? Um, you know, some poor family had had typhus. I've, I've written there that they had it when they got on board. They had had typhus, you know, um, previously. But it, there's every chance, there's every chance that they will have brought the typhus. Does anyone know what causes typhus? No, didn't think so. Typhus is caused by having on your body inflected, infected ticks or fleas. And they poo all over your skin and when you scratch you give yourself a subcutaneous injection of the organisms that are in the 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 fleas poo and that's what gives you typhus so there's every possibility that they will have taken infected fleas onto on the boat with them there's every possibility of that but as well as everything else there was a smallpox outbreak 
It just defies belief. Hasn't been a recorded case of smallpox in the world since 1985. They had four on one boat. No, 18. There is a whole thread of people throughout this crisis saying, I don't know what everyone's worried about, we've dealt with cholera before, you know, this is just diarrhea, there's a whole load of people who deny it. It's not as bad as all that. And you know, you know, for a disease-ridden ridden city, you know, month to month over 12 months, it, it, but, but the, the final summation, the final, uh, the final death count was, um, I think 5,000 people got the disease and 1,000 died in the end. And then again, look, then again, this is, this is round about August we're talking about now. That there's someone still saying, you're not drawing a distinction between Asian and English cholera. The normal sweat of a human being is neutral, and in these people, it's seriously acid. Well, this must have been the um, this must have been the final stage of their illness as they were developing, you know, acidosis because the blood volume had been depleted. And the other the other sign that the doctors are always talking about with these people is thick, tarry, viscous blood, you know, um, and they, not in not in the not in the uh, not in this. But in other places, they, they talked about you know, different types of treatments. And one of the treatments that they were trying at the time was what they called artificial serum, which was water with stuff in. Yeah? And uh, someone said, well, it, it seems to work temporarily, but it doesn't last. You know? I.e., they probably gave one injection, two injections, instead of giving a, a, a proper infusion. But you know, th this was only something that, that people would, um, that would come to later on. So, <coughs> he, he pr <laughs> bicarbonate and ginger. Not that I have any uh, pecuniary interest in any of this. They were all keen to say that because, um, you know, the suspicion was that the doctors were cashing in, you know. There's another, here's another one I'm going to write soon. I'm going to do a comparison of medical advertisements in a decade. What, what were they advertising in 1839? What were they advertising? Because the front page of these is just full of doctors' doctors' advertisements, you know. And in, the, in 1849, 1850, the, the advertisements take on, we will give you confidential treatment, and we guarantee that none of our treatments carry, carry mercury. And the whole codology in that, in the mercury was a treatment for syphilis, and therefore, this was, uh, this was STD clinics advertising. So there you've got this conundrum. This conundrum keeps on coming up again and again. If cholera is contagious, how come the doctors who are looking after these patients aren't themselves contracting the disease? How come the nurses aren't contracting the disease? And someone reports, again unreferenced, someone, re someone reports the case of two doctors in Russia who have been responsible for getting a, for getting a village quarantined and the people were there were so desperate that they grabbed hold of these doctors, they tied them to corpses, they chucked them in the plague pit with the rest of them. <laughs> And the fellas escaped after one or two days, perfectly healthy. Now, whether that was an apocryphal story or whether it was actually true, who knows? But, um, but <laughs> you, you, you can see how to heart this question went if they're publishing that sort of thing. Any questions? Well, they might have had um, they might have had a, a, a sublethal dose. I mean, in most in most epidemics where there's fatal diseases, that that's always a question, isn't it? You know, when you get an, when you get an, why do some people die and, and not others? Maybe it was they only had fifty thousand of the organisms instead of a hundred thousand.
Yeah. Yeah, Larry. I don't know what lived, I don't know what lived, my guess is that it was desperately low. And my guess is that it was, the, it was at the lowest where the diseases struck hardest. And the, 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 in, the 18, in 1832, the hardest places in Liverpool that, that, that it struck were places around, do you know, um, do you know uh, the tunnel? The tunnel by the museum, yeah? Just just a bit out of town there, there's a little nexus. There was a little nexus of very closely packed streets. And I think it was this outbreak. Uh, one in three people in one of the streets there died. You know, so, so my, guess is, my guess is that the level of literacy was, appall literacy was appallingly low, you know, and it was word of mouth. And what, but, but what, um, what, stopped the, um, what stopped the cholera riots in their tracks was, um, was priests. There's priests in the, in, the, in the pulpit saying, look, stop throwing stones at doctors. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Stop drinking the water and drink wine. You know. <laughs> um, I've done another study. I've written up another study. The next one I'm going to bore you to tears with is um, there's two, right? There's one. I'll be doing a, another review of the papers, 1848, when there was an outbreak in 1848. So they had like, you know, 15, 16 years worth of extra experience to build on. And um, the, the actual next one, the actual next one that I'm going to be doing is a profile of a doctor in 1848 called um, George Stuart Hawthorne, who claimed that he had um, an infallible cure for cholera. I'll tell you what it is. And his name was never out of the papers in, um, in 1848. And they... The medical establishment attempted to frame him. <laughs> Any other questions about this? What sort of happened in the couple of years after that then? How did the colour, how did it sort of, sort of go off? It just petered out. Because obviously over, over, over decades then sanitation improved. Yeah. Yeah, but immediately following 1832. Immedi immediately. Well, I, uh, my, the impression I get is that although it sank right down, there was still the odd case that kept on breaking out. You know, the, 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 it didn't go away exactly. Not like us. If we got one case anywhere in the country today, it'd be murder, wouldn't it? It'd be absolute murder. Well, I think these were, these were sort of bubbling away, you know. Um, and why it took another... Why it took another pandemic to come and start it all off again, I, I don't understand that. But maybe, maybe the organism mutated. But what, but what is... Well, Hamblin, Hamblin in his book, what he points out is that um, is the cholera very often followed the tracks of rivers. You know what I mean? Um, so that people working on the river would kind of sp spread the disease pretty much, I suppose, the way um, air flight does these days. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.